Thank you, Brenda. This is Ashley speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great, Ashley. It's a, great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to share with you some information about the ICH uh, Q12 guideline. You had a nice introduction to the ICH process on the prior session, so I'll jump right in. So we're all familiar with expectations about product quality when we think of items in our everyday lives like cell phones or cars or even computers. And we expect that drugs should really be no different. Patients, and that includes those of us who work at FDA, expect a safe and effective medicine with every dose they take. So we think of pharmaceutical quality as assuring that every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. And that's what gives patients confidence in their next dose of medication. So in today's session, our learning objectives include understanding post-approval change management and the role of the ICH Q12 guideline, identifying the key tools and enablers described in Q12, and understanding the concept of established conditions. We'll start with a little bit of a look into the regulatory background behind this guideline. So in the regulations applicable to NDAs and ANDAs at 314.70, is language that says an applicant must notify FDA about each change in each condition established in an approved application. And there is similar language in the 600s that applies to BLAs. In the past, there has been some confusion about what each condition established means. Does that mean everything in the application or only certain things in the application? And that confusion has at times led to changes that weren't reported when they should have been or supplements that were submitted, but at the wrong categorization level. There's also been confusion over which changes need to be reported to FDA versus those change, changes that could be managed under the firm's pharmaceutical quality system alone. In addition, we find ourselves now in a global environment where for most firms, making a change uh, around the world requires approval from as many as 100 or more regulators. You combine that with uncertainty in timelines for review as well as data expectations across those regulators, and you can end up with the need to manage multiple lines of inventory as a change works its way through the global regulatory system, which can increase costs and overall lead to fewer changes that might improve processes. These were also reasons behind the development of ICHQ12, which is titled Technical and Regulatory Considerations for Pharmaceutical Product Lifecycle Management. The objectives of the guideline were to harmonize change management across ICH regions and hopefully beyond, to really focus on a risk-based approach to regulatory oversight, emphasizing the control strategy as a key part of the application, and really to then facilitate the idea of continual improvement as envisioned in Q10 and to facilitate the introduction of innovation. Finally, the tools in Q12 are intended to provide an approach to prospective change management that would help firms be more strategic in how they think about making post-approval changes. The key principles of the Q12 guideline include that it provides a framework to facilitate the management of post-approval CMC changes in a more predictable and efficient manner. It includes a number of regulatory tools and enablers, along with their guiding principles that are harmonized across the ICH regions. Importantly, it has a focus on how increased product and product knowledge can contribute to a better understanding of which post-approval CMC changes require reporting to the regulator. And it emphasizes the importance of an effective PQS in how changes are managed across the product life cycle. The scope of the guideline includes drug substances, drug products. This is both small and large molecules. Uh, it includes then innovator products, generics, and biosimilars. The guideline also applies to drug device combination products that meet the definition of a pharmaceutical or biological product, which in the US regulatory system, this means drug device and biologic device combination products that are regulated by CDER and CBER. 
the scope does not include changes that relate to updates to pharmacopoeia monographs. There are several tools in Q12 that I'd like to focus on today. These are established conditions, post-approval change management protocols, product lifecycle management document, and structured approaches for frequent CMC post-approval changes. The first and perhaps most prominent tool included in ICHQ12 is this concept of established conditions. And if you think back to my earlier slide where we talked about the language in our regulation that says each condition established, you'll realize this term is very closely linked and comes from, in fact, uh, that language in our regulations. So the Q12 guideline defines established conditions, or ECs as we call them, as legally binding information considered necessary to assure product quality, which means then that if you make a change to an established condition, there needs to be some type of reporting to the regulatory authority. Another key concept related to established conditions is the idea that all regulatory submissions contain a combination of both established conditions and supportive information, where supportive information is not an established condition, but is provided in the application to give context to the regulator to provide additional detail, background information, and to help justify which elements are proposed as established conditions and the proposed reporting category for changes to those established conditions. The extent, meaning how many established conditions and how narrowly or broadly defined they are, will depend on a number of factors, um, including the level of process and product understanding that the firm has, which can be linked to their development approach, but also to other experience, uh, as well as the potential risk to product quality posed by that particular element if it were changed. I particularly want to mention that uh, product and process understanding isn't just from development studies. It can come from platform knowledge uh, and or commercial experience. So after identifying established conditions, an applicant may also propose a reporting category for a post-approval change to that established condition with a justification. There are two different options for applicants who are proposing established conditions. The first is to follow existing regulations and guidance. For example, uh, we have a number of guidances under SUPAC, uh, the Scale Up and Post-Approval Changes Guidances. We also have the changes to an approved NDA or ANDA that call out the types of changes and how those are appropriately reported. But an applicant may also propose an alternate reporting category with justification for that alternate. So for example, uh, proposing a CBE0 or a CBE30 instead of a PAS. That reporting category will be dependent on the potential risk to quality. Uh, and so the applicant should be using the risk assessment approaches that are described in ICHQ9 and, and think about the risk that a change to that established condition would pose in the context of the overall control strategy as well as whether other concurrent changes might be made at the same time. This is a very brief overview of this tool, but in short, established conditions offer an important opportunity for applicants to gain clarity regarding which elements of the control strategy have to be reported if changed, how much flexibility exists within an identified established condition. So for example, if an established condition is for blend speed, and that blend speed uh, established condition is set with a range of 10 to 20 RPMs, only changes to that blend speed outside of that range, so below 10 or above 20, would need to be reported, which gives the applicant uh, room to maneuver within that established range without needing to report to the agency. Established conditions also provide clarity on how changes should be reported in terms of the specific reporting type. And I'll also mention that it is possible to apply the concept of established conditions to device constituent parts of a drug device or biologic device combination product. 
The next tool I'd like to discuss is post-approval change management protocols, or PACMPs. Importantly, I want you to understand that this is the same thing as what we call a comparability protocol here in the United States. These protocols are intended to provide a transparent and predictable way for an applicant to establish requirements and studies that would be needed to implement a future change. Importantly, these protocols can be very specific. It can be for one change for a single product, or it can be for multiple changes to a single product or many changes to multiple products. So there's lots of flexibility in how protocols can be established. These protocols may be submitted with an original application, or they can be submitted subsequently as a standalone pre-approval prior approval supplement. For those of you who are familiar with the comparability protocol approach, this will seem very familiar to you because it really matches up quite well. The first step is to submit a written protocol. Uh, that protocol includes what the proposed change or changes would be, uh, risk management activities that would be conducted at the time, uh, any proposed studies and acceptance criteria that would needed to be met uh, to assess the impact of that change, the rep proposed reporting category for the change, what's it's been uh, assessed, and any other supportive information. And this protocol then has to be approved by FDA before it can be executed. But once approved, the applicant has the flexibility to then implement it when they're ready. And so when they are ready to implement that change, they would carry out the tests and studies that are outlined in the protocol. And if the results meet the acceptance criteria in the protocol, then this information would be submitted according to the reporting category that was approved in the protocol. And that reporting category may or may not require prior approval from the regulator. We've been asked, well, what is the difference between established conditions and, and PAC and P's? They seem very similar. And so this table might help to clarify that difference. So you'll see that, that both of these tools um, provide transparency and agreement with the regulator about uh, changes to be reported, and they can allow for a reduced reporting category compared to existing regulations and guidance. And in both cases, there needs to be a scientific justification for the proposed approach. But the main difference between ECs and a PACMP is that only the protocol requires that the studies and acceptance criteria to support a future change be outlined at the time of the submission. Next, I'll move on to the product life cycle management document. So this document really serves as a repository for all of this uh, post-approval change management type of information. So this will include your established conditions, the reporting categories for changes to those established conditions, protocols, if one has been submitted, and any post-approval CMC commitments. The idea behind this document is to facilitate and encourage a more strategic approach to life cycle management by putting all of these things in one place and encouraging an applicant to think more proactively and prospectively about their change management in the future. We also think this will help to facilitate the idea of continuous improvement after the product is approved and on the market. As, men, uh, as with uh, the other elements, uh, a PLCM can be submitted with the original application. So if established conditions are being proposed in an original application, a PLCM should be submitted. Uh, if established conditions are submitted later in a supplement, for example, then a PLCM should be submitted with that supplement. And in the US, we're asking that this uh, PLCM document be placed in section 3.2R of the ECTD. And then when changes are made to an established condition, when those changes are reported, whether through a supplement or an annual report, an updated PLCM document to reflect that change should accompany that submission. Lastly, I'd like to talk about structured approaches to frequent CMC post-approval changes. This section was added to the guideline to really address products already on the market and for whom their application process may not have involved identification of established conditions and reporting categories, since certainly already marketed products is a much larger bucket of products than new products coming to us now. And the idea is to provide a simplified approach to accomplish certain frequent CMC changes through the use of immediate or other post-implementation notification submissions. 
The Q12 guideline includes an initial example of this approach and provides specific criteria that are defined for changes to analytical procedures. The guideline outlines that if the approach is followed and all the criteria are met, the analytical procedure change can be made with immediate or other post-implementation notification as appropriate given the change to the regulator. And the intent of this approach is to incentivize firms with already marketed products to make updates to their analytical procedures to at least equivalent or better methods. Underlying all of the concepts that I've talked about today is the idea of an effective pharmaceutical quality system. And an effective PQS really includes change management. It's enabled by good knowledge management practices and management review. You may be familiar that ICHQ-10 describes principles for effective management under the change management under the PQS. ICHQ-12 takes this to a next level in that it elaborates more on the principles of change management and management review since change management is so important to the tools described in Q12. So you may be wondering, well, when can I start to use the tools that you've now outlined in Q12? So as you heard from Amanda, the last step of implementation of an ICH guideline is to publish it as a final FDA guidance. And so that process uh, is ongoing, uh, and we hope in the next few months to have the final FDA guidance uh, published. Uh, on the other hand, comparability protocols, since those were a pre-existing tool available to applicants in the U.S., those can be submitted at any time. There's an existing draft guidance from 2016, and we plan to update that guidance, which will be uh, consistent with what's in the Q12 guideline as well. We also plan to publish a draft implementation guidance with more details on using ICHQ12 in the U.S. And ICHQ12 training materials are now in development for worldwide use, and that training program will uh, roll out as an activity of the ICHQ12 implementation working group. So in conclusion, ICHQ12 offers multiple tools for applicants to have better clarity and regulatory flexibility regarding post-approval CMC changes. And importantly, it offers the opportunity to gain additional flexibility as product and process knowledge is gained so that more changes can be made under the PQS alone without the need for a regulatory submission. But maintaining an effective PQS, especially with respect to change management, is key to successful use of these tools. So I'd like to acknowledge my uh, cohorts on the FDA ICH Q12 team, our internal CEDAR and CBER Q12 support group, as well as the entire expert working group for ICH Q12. So here are our challenge questions for today. Is this statement true or false? Under ICH Q12, established conditions can be proposed by the applicant only as a part of an original application. It's false. Established conditions can be submitted as part of a prior approval supplement. Our next challenge question, which of the following is not a Q12 tool or enabler? Product lifecycle management document, post-approval change management protocol, manufacturing site certification, or established conditions? Manufacturing site certification, not a part of Q12. So thank you very much for your time today, and I appreciate you joining this uh, SBIA Generic Drug Forum. Thank you. And thank you, Ashley. That was great. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get set up for our next presenter. Um, let me go ahead and bring up your slide there, Thomas. And then we can go ahead and... Uh, Turn on the bar so you can request control. All right. Thomas, you should be able to uh, request control of the slide. And there you are. Let me go ahead and accept that. You now have control, uh, and uh, I will turn it over to you. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so it's my pleasure to join you today to talk about uh, emerging technology and advanced manufacturing. The title of my talk, Fostering Innovation Through Collaboration, is really going to be the theme of the presentation, really how we can support innovation by working together. 
So learning, <clears throat> learning objectives for today's talk will be explain why advanced manufacturing, emerging technology in general is important, both for the FDA as well as from an industry perspective. And really then to describe efforts, you know, what are we trying to do to help uh, support uh, the implementation of advanced manufacturing for pharmaceuticals. And then I'm going to end with a couple case studies that talk about two aspects of our program and how they work together, which is the emerging technology team as well as the research um, and science into advanced manufacturing and emerging technologies and how these two programs really work together. I'll try to illustrate that through a couple of case studies uh, before we conclude. The first uh, topic of, for the today is really just try to emphasize the importance of advanced manufacturing. So to do this, I uh, just want to start off by um, comparing, you know, how is ph pharmaceutical manufacturing, when we look compared to other industries, how does the performance look? Um, well, every industry operates its own environment and has its own constraints. Um, I think this does help illustrate uh, areas where potentially pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, could improve. So, if you look at overall equipment effectiveness, it's generally very uh, low compared to other industries for pharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, depending on studies, this ranges from 10 to 60 percent. Generally, for other industries, you can think of uh, automotive manufacturing, it's kind of 70 to 85 percent. Um, aerospace, kind of higher, 50 to 70 percent again. Um, and other industries are kind of up in that same, similar kind of range. Another area where you see Significant uh, differences is kind of the first pass yield or zero defects. Uh, typically, this is kind of in pharmaceutical engineering, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, this is kind of some benchmarks around 60%. Typically, other industries are kind of closer to 90%. So, this is a significant difference there as well. Uh, I think this then leads to diff the longer production lead times. So, in, in pharma, we typically have four to six months, depending on the types of products from your manufacturing where other industries, even kind of uh, aerospace industry, that would be 7 to 120 days. Uh, other industries are very even shorter, uh, maybe 5 to 10 days. This kind of results in larger inventories to kind of buffer that capacity. So generally, pharma has an inventory of about 60, 90 days. Other industries are kind of uh, smaller, smaller days. And that's really, I think, important. It helps with buffer uh, different supply disruptions. Of course, that's based on planning. And when there's larger disruptions, that inventory might not be able to uh, buffer that change. So what is advanced manufacturing? So advanced manufacturing can be novel methods to improve our process for process and efficiency. So that's kind of manufacturing what we do today, but better. It could be a new way to manufacture different do dosage forms or different delivery systems to improve delivery and targeting. So basically make things that we're not making today. Um, and also, I can include novel analytical tools to improve quality testing, uh, process monitoring, and control. So you, one of the things you'll notice that with all these different types, one thing is that the novelty, so it's not typically used in today's uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing environment, and it's also delivering benefits. So that, that benefit is why we uh, view kind of advanced manufacturing both important to the FDA and patients, as well as from the industry perspective. To help us address uh, some of the underlying causes of drug shortage, it basically help us from a process robustness perspective, as well as a lot of these new technologies can help us uh, either ramp up or ramp down uh, supply to help to mitigate um, disruptions, facilitate new manufacturing of new uh, modalities or new ways to deliver medicine, whether that's personalized and individualized medicine or combination products, uh, I mean, uh, fixed dose uh, products. And also to improve manufacturing efficiency, uh, increase, increase process robustness, lower manufacturing costs, and increase our supply chain flexibility. So these are, I think, all ways we can deliver benefit both from the uh, patient uh, perspective as well as from the industry perspective. As a generic industry and advanced manufacturing, I think there's some uh, misconception that this kind of uh, our programs are really tailored to the new drug pro uh, program, but we see this as applicable to all drug uh, types, whether it's throughout the product life cycle, whether it's a new drug, generic drug, uh, over-the-counter medicine, or, or biotechnology. So this is because uh, these benefits, I think, apply all those different uh, drug classes. It's also we've noticed through the emerging technology team working with different sponsors in the generic drug industry that they're also seeing value in this. So this kind of 
uh, validates that assumption that um, they are finding different technologies that really can improve uh, their manufacturing of their uh, products. Uh, that, but there are challenges to implementation, though. Uh, so, uh, you know, adoption of emerging technology does require new investment. Um, and there's different, uh, so while new tech uh, advanced manufacturing can apply to all different product uh, types, we recognize that the business environment and business uh, considerations are different in these different industries. Uh, so one thing that for a generic uh, manufacturer, the types of products you're man manufacturing might uh, fluctuate uh, more rapidly than in the, in the new drug uh, product portfolio. So I think really platform technologies is really something that could uh, help uh, address that. There's also the development of new knowledge, knowledge and skills. Uh, and then with any implementation of uh, challenges, there's also the consideration of, of regulatory. Um, how does it apply in the regulatory environment? And that's where I think through collaboration, uh, we can overcome these challenges and foster innovation. There's no really single technology that's a silver bullet, but I think there are a lot of opportunities, uh, and we see sponsors identifying them uh, that can really improve their manufacturing. And working together, I think we can get these implemented. So what are CEDAR's efforts in advanced manufacturing? First one I'd like to talk about is our emerging technology program, and then I'll talk about science and research. So the emerging technology program is a program with a mission to encourage and support the adoption of innovative technology to modernize pharmaceutical development manufacturing. Again, you'll through close collaboration with industry and relevant stakeholders. So this is a really collaborative uh, program. Both, uh, and the, the core of this program is a small cross-functional team called the Emerging Technology Team with representatives from all the relevant FDA quality assessment and inspection programs. So that includes the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, but it also includes the Office of Compliance and the Office of Regulatory Affairs. So what are the objectives? So what are the objectives for the, this program? So first of all, it provides a, a forum for for firms to engage in early dialogue with the FDA to support innovation. Especially, um, this is a very, I think, a very important part of the program. And as we talked about before, the unique part of this program is that you do not need to have uh, an application uh, pending. So this can be kind of not tied to a specific product be something you're thinking of applying across multiple products. I uh, want to get the agency's early feedback about different uh, considerations that might be important when implementing that particular technology. It helps to ensure consistency, and continuity, and predictability in the assessment and the inspection. We do that by having the same uh, team for that early engagement that follow throughout the entire life cycle of the application. Uh, we heard, so another important aspect of this is international. Uh, regulatory and the ETT does uh, engage with our international partners to really share learnings and approaches. I think that's really important to facilitate this adoption. Um, and as necessary, when we build up enough knowledge to help establish scientific standards uh, and policy as needed, working with our policy office. ETT takes a collaborative approach. This is both with uh, industry and internally, and so. It really by following it through this, this life cycle. So from early engagement, one aspect I really want to emphasize here is this emerging technology site visit. This is an opportunity to actually engage at the, um, with the, with actually visit where the, where the technology is going to be implemented in the facility, have really uh, extensive kind of dialogue, and also consider not just the technology aspects, uh, application aspects, but really also the quality uh, management system aspects about how it's going to be implemented uh, within the pharmaceutical quality system at that facility. And I think that's a really important part of successfully implementing your know, novel technology. And again, the same team members will follow through the integrated quality assessment and actually engage in the pre-approval uh, inspection. So again, you, you get really consistent feedback, both from the early engagement all the way through to the uh, eventual application approval. So getting ready for ETT uh, meetings, I think it's really about having the right mindset and culture. So from our perspective, it's kind of coming into it with an open mind, willingness to learn. 
really making science and, and risk-based assessment decisions, not just relying on uh, precedent, but you know, obviously some new technologies really challenge that. Uh, but be just transparent in our thinking, uh, not afraid to ask questions, right? And a multidisciplinary approach, right? And very collaborative with all the authors here. I think from the industry perspective, really helpful to engage early, uh, be transparent, um, and, and sharing kind of that early engagement and not afraid to kind of receive and, and kind of address questions, right? Because it's really an opportunity to learn together. And really kind of view regulatory, it's really collaboration, uh, not an adversarial relationship. We're really trying to work together, right, to, to get, make this happen. Uh, and we feel like through this program, we are, we are getting there. If you want to know more about the Emerging Technology team and the program, we have a website. Uh, you can visit to kind of learn the latest information. Second part of our program, really, when you're dealing with, well, how do you make science and risk-based decisions? Well, you need to have that uh, science and, and knowledge, understand uh, background, right, to the foundation. And that's really where our research program comes in. So the knowledge gained from our internal and externally sponsored research can help inform the feedback we're giving to industry and these early engagements, right? So this is, it helps can actually generate some questions. Maybe industry is asking, well, what do you think about this? We, they really have a good answer for that at the moment, and that can generate, we actually need to do some research in that area to provide kind of that science of risk-based feedback. And so this is really kind of a, um, an opportunity for this shared learning and open communication, and, and I think that together with generating that knowledge really helps accelerate that adoption. Again, collaborations allow OPW to leverage external expertise and capabilities to address scientific issues, especially when something uh, is really novel. Uh, we have uh, funding mechanisms that can help us work with external experts to really help build up our, our internal capabilities. So in the last few minutes, I would like to kind of spend some time really walking through a couple case studies um, that we've seen both in the emerging technology uh, program as well as uh, the kind of research and how that, how that works together. The first case study I'd like to talk to you about is about continuous manufacturing of APIs. And one of the key questions when you kind of implement this type of technology is what's the appropriate uh, in-process controls for ensuring process performance and product quality. Uh, so in this case study, we actually had a case where um, the kind of the brand, uh, the original new drug product was made kind of using traditional technology and the generic uh, you know, firm wants to apply some new novel technology in case manufacturing uh, to really help them to deliver this uh, a generic version of, of this medicine. So why why would that be the uh, case? Okay. So the driving forces for some continuous manufacturing of APIs is it can help enable actually new chemistries um, by improving this kind of the safety safety profile of actually carrying out certain reactions, and that was true in this case. Uh, and and being able to kind of carry out these reactions in a safer kind of uh, environment actually kind of also can lead to cost savings. So when we look at this, the um, continuous manufacturing APIs, we recognize this is characterized by a diversity, just like you uh, expect in API manufacturing. And there's many different configurations. Uh, but one thing that's kind of uh, common is the need to kind of generate process monitoring to de detect range of disturbances. And one of the issues that might be present in these uh, manufacturing processes is, is solids. So solids can form because you, um, they're a reagent. They can form as an intermediate or byproduct of the reaction, or they can be the product themselves. And because these uh, reaction systems are generally have kind of smaller channels, this can lead to uh, clogging and, and uh, process performance, potentially quality issues. So you know, our, our uh, research studies, we've kind of developed both PAT and uh, uh, model-based, so actually using process uh, information, just in the process, to actually inform a, qual a product quality monitoring approaches, and actually looking at uh, disturbances to the system and how they would impact quality, and really understanding that the impact on quality is really going to be both based on the magnitude and duration of the disturbances, not the way we typically we usually get uh, limits uh, as a single number. But I think it's, it's helpful to look at this in a kind of two-dimensional uh, framework, and we've av we've heavily investigated this issue of uh, clogging and, and rush disruptions. So you can see on the the second chart uh, there on the screen, what we have is a crystallization system where we had a clogging event on the bottom one, 
And you see that's actually led to a disruption that kind of counts the number of particles as well as the size of those particles in the process. Um, and as the clogging event is mitigated, uh, they return back to the um, state of control and, and the kind of normal expected count and size. So I think things to think about is uh, under, utilize kind of your process, product and process understanding to identify the root cause, demonstrating detectability, and certain prompt, uh, established process criteria that can be tracked to drive continuous improvement. So I think when we reflect back on this uh, case, one of the things we learned about is just the importance of that site visit um, and kind of building that into the, um, your, your, your timeline for when you're going to submit your application, especially working that in, because a lot of these issues we're talking about here, uh, realizing that you need a robust process, but you might not solve everything right away. You, you have to learn over time, and having that site visit really can help look at that. Uh, so I don't have too much uh, time, but I just want to talk about the second case study. This is quality attributes for parental. So this is actually um, on the container closure system. We realized that uh, what's its current state? There's actually been a lot of post innovations in this space. And address issues that have been caused due to recalls for class like breakage, particles, uh, et cetera. So in this research program, we, we assess two general kind of categories of risk in pharmaceutical containers under normal storage and stress conditions, the uh, mechanical stresses as well as chemical stresses, um, and applied a, a number of different techniques to really come up with a platform approach to assess these uh, technologies. So that, that was really the outcome of this uh, program. You could see some free soft studies uh, looking at different vials, and you can see the impact that it has on quality, as well as some uh, pH effects. And you can see that depending on the pH and the, and the container closure system, the prevalence of flakes and particles uh, that changes. And this, I, for this, I think, case study, what, another thing we learned about collaboration here is it's really collaboration across from vendors to manufacturers to regulatory agencies and also some uh, standard setting agencies like uh, USP get uh, involved in this, in this particular case. Uh, and it's really kind of working together as a whole industry that we can actually facilitate the adoption uh, advances in these kind of different aspects of product manufacturing. So that I just kind of end with our uh, the challenge question. So, so the FDA science research activities and collaborations are crucial to informing uh, emerging technology team interactions with stakeholders. Uh, this is true. Uh, and then we also utilize collaborations to leverage external expertise and capabilities to regulatory science and topics. So that I just like to um, close by just uh, reanalyzing the kind of the, I think. Uh, these new kind of advanced manufacturing emerging technologies that have a longer term solution to help uh, improve product quality and, and pharmaceutical manufacturing in general. Uh, we really think this is really going to happen through close collaboration. Uh, and it applies to all different kinds of products, uh, including generic products. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, OPG collaborators who actually worked on a lot of these case studies, uh, the emerging technology team members, uh, as well as our industry partners who are really kind of uh, leading the charge here to get these things uh, implemented. Thank you. And thank you, Thomas. That was great. Um, and I apologize for rushing you along with the, the countdown light there a little bit, but you did an outstanding job. What we're going to do now is go ahead and move into our Q&A. Um, uh, we'll be bringing back Ashley to join uh, Thomas and uh, We've been collecting your questions in the background. Um, and it, for those of you that are uh, paying close attention to the uh, agenda, you will see that we are running a little bit behind. We're actually going to go ahead and extend and take uh, run the Q&A through 12 o'clock noon Eastern time. And then I'll tell you a little bit later about how we'll uh, shorten the, the break. OK, so with that, I am going to stop prattling on turn it over to uh, Lisa, who will be reading our first. Great. Thank you, um, Jeff. Our first question is for Ashley. Are you there, Ashley? I am. OK, great. All right. So the first question is for you. Um, once the ICHQ-12 is adopted, Will the existing guidance, like changes to NDA or ANDA April 2004, will that be removed by FDA? 
And if so, what would be the transition time? So thank you for the question. Uh, we do plan to look at all of our existing post-approval change related guidance documents, including that one, to see whether we need to make updates uh, because of ICHQ-12, but we don't plan to make those go away. Um, those guidances will still be very useful uh, because the use of established conditions is not a requirement. Um, this is voluntary on the part of the applicant. Uh, and so there will be, we expect, uh, a number of applicants who will want to continue to manage their post-approval changes uh, according to those existing guidance documents. And that's fine, and that's why those guidances will remain. Uh, but we will take a look to make any updates that would be relevant because of the publication of Q12. Okay, great. Thank you, Ashley. So another question for you, can the EC change category be based on FDA's guidance on changes, and can that, can that be made using the annual report? Yes. So uh, as I mentioned, the applicant has a choice if they have proposed established conditions. The reporting categories can either track with our existing guidances, like the changes to an approved NDA or ANDA. Uh, or they can propose alternate reporting categories based on a justification. Uh, those reporting categories, whether they follow existing guidance or propose uh, something different, uh, one of the reporting categories is still in your report. So that, that remains an option for reporting certain CMC changes. OK, great. One more question for Ashley, and we'll switch to Thomas and maybe come back. Do we have, for Ashley, do we have any, is there a template or a model for the PLCM document? That's a great question. So the uh, Q12 guideline uh, does include an example. Uh, there's a, a set of annexes that go with the guideline that include examples of a number of the tools in the guideline. Uh, and one of those examples is a PLCM document. Our FDA implementation guidance will also include that example fleshed out a little bit more uh, for a U.S. applicant. So uh, if you want to look at the ICH website now, you can look at the annexes for Q12 and see that example now. You'll see something relatively similar to that in the FDA implementation guidance once that is posted. Thank you, Ashley. All right, this next question is for Tom. So the questioner wants to know, can you talk about and give some examples of where the science and research collaborations have been applied, and what were the results of the collaboration? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I think I tried to highlight that some of the uh, like case studies. So really, our science and research program helps us to provide um, I think uh, science risk based <laughs> feedback to uh, sponsors' questions. So a lot of these questions are generated from sponsor asking for clarity. So clarity kind of could be, well, how much should I monitor the process? This is our proposed kind of consistent with what you're expecting. And that's where we're kind of applying our, our findings to, uh, so in the continuous API side, what was the impact on, on quality of these different disturbances events? Um, and so those, those are, I think, an example of where we applied that, that knowledge we gained through these collaborations to that early feedback. And I think that helps sponsors implement the uh, technology. OK, great. So another question about the ETP. So with reference to introducing new technology to legacy products, if someone wants to do that, and they have well-established experience and the know-how, what do you think would be your advice and how to collaborate with the ETP or work with them? And as a follow-up, does the ETP include BLAs or generics only? So the ETP, uh, that's the second question first. The ETP includes uh, both uh, biotechnology products and drug products as well as generic products. Um, so we all our application uh, products. And I would say, you know, for the um, uh, second question, I think if you had a kind of extensive knowledge of marketed uh, products and want to implement technology and improve that, uh, that's, we, we have cases like that uh, through, the, through the program. Um, and I think you would uh, send out your request to the 
uh, ETT mailbox, and you can leverage all that knowledge you have about that product to really justify uh, your approach when it might not need technology. And hopefully, really use that knowledge to make sure that that's faster. Awesome. Okay, great. And if the company has questions and wants to follow up about the ETP, what what's the best way to contact? that team or the FDA about the ETP? Uh, the uh, Theater uh, Emergency Technology team does have a, a mailbox. I think, um, uh, I believe it's on uh, one of the, the slides in the presentation. I think it's like Theater ETP, but uh, um, you can uh, check, I think, the slides for sure. Okay, great. And another, just one more, one more question for Thomas. So the company is planning to implement NIR analysis for blend uniformity and content uniformity testing of tablets and capsules. Can this be routed to the emerging technology team? <clears throat> so I think you know, one of the aspects, I think in the program when you submit your request, you have to justify kind of why it's a novel approach and how it's going to improve product quality. Certainly, implementation of PAT uh, would help improve the knowledge of that product. But that, in that particular case, is something we have actually a lot of experience with. Um, so I think you know, through the regular uh, normal uh, review channels, you can get appropriate uh, feedback. But whenever you go approach the ETT, I think that's uh, approaching why this is going to be novel, um, and as well as how it's going to impact product quality. All right, great. And we're going to go back to Ashley. Do you expect that the agency will expect applicants to include the PLCM guidance for every new ANDA and supplement filings right after the FDA guidance is posted, or how soon after would the agency be expecting that? Thanks for that question, Lisa. So the uh, use of established conditions and the submission of a PLCM document um, is not required. It's a voluntary process. So uh, applicants who are interested in pursuing established conditions, either through an original ANDA or through a prior approval supplement, will be able to do that once FDA publishes its version of Q12 as a final FDA guidance. And hopefully that will happen in the next couple of months. Um, but it is not a requirement that would apply to every ANDA. So a PLCM document is needed when a firm is proposing established conditions uh, with or without different reporting categories. Um, but it doesn't apply to everyone. It's a voluntary program. Great. OK. And another question for Ashley. Could a comparability protocol be applied to new aseptic manufacturing units within an FDA-approved manufacturing site? So um, the comparability protocol can be uh, um, you know, submitted for any number of different changes. So um, new sites, uh, new manufacturing processes. Um, uh, there are a number of different types of changes that could be eligible for a comparability protocol. Um, I would refer the questioner to our uh, draft guidance from 2016 on comparability protocols, which includes the Q&A, um, and uh, that guidance should be updated uh, with a final um, in, the, in the near future as well. Um, but uh, without more specifics, it's hard to rule in or rule out uh, a particular type of change for a comparability protocol. Um, but certainly, uh, the, the breadth of what can be in a protocol is, is fairly wide. OK, great. We have another question. And they would like you to clarify or clarify on the PACMP. Are the changes to written protocols, should they be submitted for approval, or should they be submitted with executed results as a supplement? So the way the protocol works is the protocol before any change has been implemented, the protocol is submitted as a prior approval supplement. And FDA will approve that protocol. Once that happens, the firm can implement the change that's described in the protocol at the time that they're ready. And then if the results of the tests and the studies that are outlined in the protocol meet the acceptance criteria, 
then the firm would report those results according to the reporting category laid out in the protocol. So for example, a firm might propose a, re a comparability protocol for a change and propose that the results would be reported in a CBE 30. So if FDA approved that protocol at whatever time, six months, 12 months down the road, whenever the, the firm is ready to implement that change, they would carry out that protocol. And if the, the tests meet the acceptance criteria, they would then submit the CBE 30 and then be able to implement that change. So I hope that helps to clarify. Great, thank you. All right, we have another question for Ashley. Can EECs be submitted in AR if they only reflect the approved conditions? So the first time that an applicant proposes established conditions to the agency, that should happen in an original application or in a prior approval supplement. After that, certain changes to established conditions may be appropriate to be reported in an annual report. Great. A follow up on established conditions. Is there a target implement a target implementation date for e for established conditions, or is that optional? So, as mentioned, it is optional. Um, we do hope that a number of applicants will take advantage of the established conditions tool within Q12, um, and we will um, start to receive applications with established conditions proposed in them after FDA publishes the final FDA guidance version of Q12. Okay. And another question. What about the change? In, what about the change guidelines? formerly the DAC-PAC guidance to be reported for a type 2 API DMF. When, this guidance, when will this guidance be made effective again? So thank you for that question. So for those who may not be familiar with the, the guidance that some have referred to as backpack, um, this is a guidance about making changes to uh, drug substance uh, that supports an ANDA. Um, FDA uh, issued a draft guidance on this topic as part of our GDUFA 2 commitments, uh, and we are in the process of reviewing the comments that we've received to the docket uh, and moving to revise the guidance as appropriate given those comments. Uh, so um, we want to be thoughtful about that process uh, in terms of revising the guidance to try to address the questions and comments we received. I don't have a time estimate on when that final guidance will be published. Um, but that is certainly something that we are actively working on. Okay. And I think we have one last question. If the changes to the if there's changes to the ANDA NDA that will be updated that they want to update, will it if changes to the ANDA NDA will be updated, will it include different dosage forms? For example, TDS, which is extended release. Um, that's something that we can look at. Um, so I think the question is about updating the existing, some of the existing post-approval changes guidance to include more specifics about some other dosage forms not currently covered. Um, that's, that's certainly something we can take back and look at, um, whether that's something that we can include as we uh, make revisions to that guidance. So thank you for the suggestion. Okay, great. And another question, the, are the USP monograph changes, should they be annual report on the annual report, or should they be submitted as a PAS? So I believe we have existing guidance about making changes to um, address pharmac appeal changes. Um, I think it depends on what the change is. So for example, if the pharmac appeal change is to uh, tighten a specification. Um, in general, those can be reported as annual report because it is, in, it is improving the safety or the quality of the product. Um, other changes may require a prior approval supplement. Uh, for example, if a change was made to comply with a pharmac appeal change, but it required that the product be reformulated, um, that may be a more significant change that might require a prior approval supplement. Okay, thank you, Ashley. This is Jeff, and I just got a note from Lisa in the back. 
channel that, that that was the last question, which is good. We're rolling right up to the the new end time that we wanted. I want to thank both Ashley and Thomas and Lisa and all of the presenters this morning. These are, are very difficult times, and uh, the whole uh, broadcasting and event as everyone shelters in place.